chapter twenty one of fuel of fire this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org fuel of fire by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter twenty one lady alicia if a sin performed is worthy blame is sin intended just the same after the new year came in the weather was so severe and nancy so fragile that mr and mrs burton decided to take her to mentone for a time in order to see what a warmer climate would do for their darling and simultaneously lord and lady portcullis with lady alicia baxendale as their guest likewise found refuge from the ferocity of an english spring in the south of france on his relations departure from drawbridge castle baxendale returned to poplar farm which return occurred just a week before the burtons fled on the wings of the winter wind to where they hoped the winter wind could not reach them poor nancy never walked in the lanes now for to her they were as one huge green cemetery of buried hopes and joys and not being the kind of woman who haunts burying grounds she wisely avoided them there are some natures that cling to the last resting places of what they have loved and delight to plant flowers there watering these flowers with tears and there are others who cannot bear the agony which the mere sight of such sepulchres arouses and who would therefore fain hide their dead away out of their sight and let them be as though they had never been god pity those bereaved hearts whose sole happiness lies in remembrance for their sorrow is indeed great but god help those more sorely afflicted ones whose sole happiness lies in forgetfulness for their misery is infinitely greater therefore it never came to pass that lawrence met nancy walking in the lanes as they used so often to meet in the happy far-off days but on the sunday he saw her face to face coming out of tetley church and the sight cut him to the heart was that thin pale careworn woman his sunny little nancy and was his the hand that had wiped the sunshine out of that bleached face and written sorrow in capital letters all over it as his heart went out silently in an agony of pity toward the girl whose life he had deliberately spoiled a wild hope took hold of lawrence that nancy was innocent after all and his mother the real culprit he hated himself for wishing to prove his mother guilty he felt that such a wish was despicable in the extreme but he had never loved her as he had loved nancy and therefore her possible wrongdoing did not wound him to the quick as nancy's did he loved lady alicia so little that forgiveness toward her came easy to him he loved nancy so much that he felt the sin of hers would be branded into his very soul and that nothing could wipe it out for ever that his mother should be weighed in the balances and be found wanting was an endurable and by no means unexpected accident but that nancy should fall short of the idea which he had formed of her was a calamity sufficient to make angels weep a punishment which he felt was greater than he could bear if however lady alicia had set fire to the hall then nancy was as innocent as he himself and there was no reason why he should not fall on his knees before her and beg her pardon for even having distrusted her and let her comfort his sore heart as she alone knew how to comfort it if nancy was heartsick for lawrence he was none the less heartsick for nancy the agony of separation was not killing him as it was killing her because a man's physique is made of stronger elements than a woman's but he hungered and thirsted and prayed and agonized not one whit less than she she was the one human being to whom he had shown all that was in his heart before whom he had poured out the hidden treasures of his soul and having once broken down the hedge of his reserve the longing to do it again was almost uncontrollable yet there was no one with whom he could do it save nancy he still felt that his mother's crime would always be his disgrace but he knew nancy well enough to understand that she would be willing to share even dishonour with him and what was more he did not mind her sharing it at last his love had shown itself stronger than his pride and he realised that nancy's pity would heal his sores rather than wound him afresh but even yet his love was not strong enough to bear that his queen should do wrong and still remain his queen it could stand anything but that nancy herself should fall below his ideal of her for this he felt he could never forgive her because in that case her sin would be against herself rather than against him 
he could forgive mere sins against himself but for sins against the woman whom he worshipped there was no pardon to be found while lawrence's heart was daily softening toward nancy and his soul was hourly crying out for her the burtons and their daughter started for mentone and he looked in vain in all the familiar places for the pale little face which had become the centre of his universe nancy was now out of his reach but that did not put her out of his thoughts in fact it had a precisely opposite effect all that early spring when the roads were swept clean by the east wind and the fields smelt of the daisies that were yet to be for there is always a smell of future daisies in the air on the first spring days lawrence's heart went out to nancy and cried for her as thirsty men cry for water in a barren and dry land where no water is the more he thought about it the more fully he became convinced that it was his mother who had set fire to baxendale hall his poor foolish mother who had never been able in all her life to discover the distinction between good and evil much less to choose the one and refuse the other he remembered how she had begged him to do the deed himself and how utterly futile had been his efforts to convince her that such a suggestion was of the nature of sin and he knew her well enough to understand how she could succeed in convincing herself that she was actually performing a righteous act in fulfilling the old prophecy as well as in making her son as she thought a rich man for the rest of his life the memory of nancy's suggestion that he should burn down the house of his father's a suggestion which had been eating into his very soul for the last six months and making his existence a burden to him began gradually to fade from his memory after all he had laid too much stress on the girl's idle words he told himself was she not always talking nonsense which she did not in the least mean and making absurd statements which he never expected to be believed and had he not shown himself an arrant fool in taking this one conversation of hers au pied de la lettre instead of accepting it as the mere joke for which it was intended so during that spring nancy once more regained her place in lawrence's life and he eagerly looked forward to the time when he could take her into his arms again and pour out all his story of shame and sorrow and wounded sensibility into her sympathetic ear he would make her understand him this time he said to himself he would never again be guilty of the folly of setting up a barrier of reserve between himself and the woman whom he adored he would tell her the whole truth how he believed that lady alicia was the culprit who had set baxendale hall in flames and that therefore he could not take the insurance money and he felt sure when nancy heard this she would see the utter impossibility of his allowing himself to reap any pecuniary benefit from his mother's crime he could not write all this to nancy his suspicion against lady alicia must never be set down in black and white lest the very birds of the air should carry it abroad it must only be whispered into nancy's ear and locked up in her loving breast for the rest of their lives so he decided to wait until she came back to wayside and to put everything straight between herself and him when they met the warmer climate of the sunny south did not do as much for nancy as her parents had hoped she lost her cough and the doctors could find nothing organically wrong with her but neither climate nor medicine can do much in the way of ministering to a mind diseased had the last miserable six months been blotted out nancy would speedily have become as strong and well as she had ever been in her life but she could not forget things she was not made after that pattern and the memory of what in one short year she had won and lost was killing her as surely as if more slowly than any disease defined by the faculty and yet she prayed to forget she hated to remember that was the hard part of it there are sweet-natured women who can cherish their sorrow until it becomes to them a familiar friend on earth and a guide to heaven who order their harmonious goings by the thought of what their loved ones would have wished until upon these gentle souls those loved ones exercise a stronger influence than they ever exercised in the days of their flesh and such women are tried by sorrow as by a refiner's fire and come out as burnished gold but nancy was not after this kind she was passionate rather than tender and so the grace of a day that is dead had no hold upon her on the contrary she chafed against it and hated it and longed to blot it for ever out of the book of her remembrance she wanted no tender memories of lawrence to occupy the place he had left vacant in her heart she desired not that grief should fill the room up of her absent love and remember her of all his gracious parts gentler women would have wished this but not nancy 
she wanted the man himself just as he was with all his over-scrupulousness and impracticability and unreasonableness to have and to hold for better for worse till death should them part failing this she prayed for forgetfulness prayed that he might depart out of her existence altogether and the memory of him might not trouble her again that he would leave her free to live her own life unvexed by the haunting shadows of what might have been and yet she was so fashioned that oblivion was impossible to her the boon she craved was strictly denied to her by the peculiarities of her own nature the more she strove to hate and to forget the more passionately did she love and the more vividly did she remember for the which surely heaven pitied her spring had fully dawned when lady alicia came back to england and to poplar farm her son was delighted to see the change which the journey had wrought in her she looked younger and happier and consequently handsomer than she had looked for years i am so glad to see you so well mother said lawrence affectionately yes dear lawrence i know i look well i noticed it myself in the looking-glass which so often tells us anything but a flattering tale as dear somebody i forget his name remarked it was the warm weather suited you ah it was not only the climate dear lawrence that renewed my youth though i confess sunshine is very sweet and soothing even if somewhat trying to the complexion but it does no real damage if one always wears a gauze veil your dear aunt's maid would not permit me positively would not permit me to step out of doors without a white gauze veil and i felt most grateful to her for her forethought she is an excellent person quite excellent i don't know what i should have done without her lawrence sighed i wish i could afford for you to have a maid of your own mother well dear child i cannot deny that a maid has a very beneficial effect upon a woman's character you see it is quite impossible to find leisure for cultivating one's higher nature if one has to do one's own hair and look after one's own wardrobe and yet it is so sweet to cultivate one's higher nature if one can find time almost a duty in fact i suppose it is lawrence with difficulty repressed a smile i always think dear st peter or was it st paul's remark i invariably mix the two up about a woman not plaiting her hair or putting on gold in apparel but having a meek and quiet spirit instead is so very beautiful and appropriate but it is only those women who have a maid to see to the plaiting of the hair and the putting on of the apparel that get the time to attend to the development of the meek and quiet spirit one woman really cannot undertake both departments herself and yet it is so sad for either to be neglected i suppose if you had only time for one you would consider the former more important said lawrence of course dear child of course because one loses caste if one's hair is badly done or one's clothes are shabby while nobody thinks any the worse of one for not having a meek and quiet spirit not that i don't think it is very sweet and christian to be both i do indeed but of course the things that show are always of more importance than the things that don't show anybody can see that of course lawrence's tone was dry and now i have a confession to make to you dear lawrence a most serious confession i am afraid you will be very angry with me you have a somewhat unreasonable temper as your poor dear father had but i feel sure you will pardon me in the end lawrence's heart stood still for a moment and then went on at double quick speed so the confession he had prepared his mind to hear was coming at last and his darling was about to be cleared from the slightest shadow of suspicion well what is it mother you see dear child poverty is peculiarly repellent to any one of my refined and sensitive nature and not only repellent it is also positively injurious it creates faults or rather i should say weaknesses which otherwise would not exist and which have never distinguished any of the motes before and it prevents the full development of virtues which properly belong to my character yes yes i hear lawrence was impatient but his mother was not going to be hurried therefore i feel it to be my duty to myself and to all around me to escape from a state which is so injurious to my higher nature you see it is the duty of us all to cultivate our higher natures dear st paul says something about working out our own salvation and i am sure he means by this that we must avoid all things which are not profitable to us in fact he uses those exact words if i remember rightly and poverty is not profitable to your salvation is that what you mean mother yes dear child how quickly you comprehend things if only your poor dear father had understood me as well as you do what a much better and happier woman i might have been lawrence had his doubts as to the accuracy of the deduction but he wisely refrained from putting them into words therefore i felt for some time that it was my duty at all costs 
to escape from poverty i was not doing myself or my higher instincts anything like justice and it is so beautiful to do justice to one's highest and best self whatever sacrifice it may involve even if it be baxendale hall itself that happens to be the burnt offering lady alicia sighed but that sacrifice was wasted you see owing to your unfortunate wrong-headedness and obstinacy then what is the second sacrifice involved in this moral regeneration it is hardly a sacrifice dear lawrence though i shall always believe that baxendale hall was burned by a miracle in order to give my higher nature a chance of fuller development i remember once coming upon a beautiful little poem about something for which i pant and fuller something else i want which exactly expresses all that i feel lawrence could hardly control his impatience as i unfortunately spoiled sacrifice number one for goodness sake tell me what sacrifice number two is and be quick about it it is not a sacrifice as i have told you dear lawrence it is only a sweet beautiful change and development dear lord watercress with whom at cannes i renewed my former friendship has again asked me to be his wife and i have accepted him lawrence was dumbfounded he had never dreamt of his mother's marrying again i think it is so touching and beautiful continued lady alicia that i should be given another chance of happiness after having been so foolish as to refuse him for the sake of your father all those years ago as dear shakespeare says there is a divinity which puts things straight again however much we may make a mole of them ourselves then lawrence found words i hope lord watercress will make you very happy mother he said gently i am sure he will dear child he has twenty thousand a year and two most charming places he says we must each go our own way and neither be bothered with the other as there is money enough for both so different from your poor dear father who was always wanting me to be with him and never could be happy without me ah dear lord watercress could have given him a lesson in unselfishness we'll leave my father out of the conversation altogether if you don't mind mother and devote our attention to his successor you see dear lawrence i am sure it is my duty to marry a rich man if i can and it is very sweet of you to take it so nicely you don't seem a bit angry and i was so afraid you would be no i am not angry i have no right to be and i want to tell you something else just to show you what a lot of harm poverty was doing to my character and how necessary it is for me to be rich if i am to be as good as i should like to be and as i ought to be for it is everybody's duty to be good don't you think i suppose so but it's a pretty hard job sometimes of course you will keep what i am going to tell you quite a secret won't you mother is it necessary to ask me that well then said lady alicia in a nervous deprecating manner totally unlike her usual calm serenity would you believe it of me dear lawrence i so hated being poor that i made up my mind to set fire to baxendale hall on purpose to get the insurance money i did indeed isn't it awful to think that poverty could bring a gentlewoman and a moat to such a strait as that and her ladyship began to cry don't cry mother dear but tell me all about it lawrence was putting a tremendous restraint upon himself that is all and it is bad enough goodness knows i see now how wicked of me it would have been but at that time i wanted money so dreadfully that i didn't care what sin i committed to get it then didn't you carry out your intention after all asked lawrence with a strange tight feeling round his heart no no sobbed lady alicia but that was no credit to me it was when i was contemplating this wicked step that somebody forestalled me goodness knows who and actually did what i had intended to do and then when i heard what people said and thought about the crime i realized what a lucky woman i had been just to have escaped committing it you see i never knew how wrong it was till i heard other people say so lawrence fell on his knees at his mother's feet mother swear to me that you are speaking the truth that you did not carry out your intention remember even if you did i would freely forgive you and keep the secret with my life no i didn't do it lawrence indeed i didn't though i don't see that i am really much better than if i had it was not my fault that i didn't carry out my sinful intention oh it is dreadful to think that i a moat could have sunk so low lawrence stretched out a trembling hand and seized a bible that was lying on his mother's work-table will you kiss this and swear that it wasn't you who set fire to the hall lady alicia kissed the book i swear that it was not i she said solemnly though i feel my guilt is the same as if it were lawrence rose from his knees with his face as white as a sheet for he knew that his mother was speaking the truth she rose also i think i will go to bed now of course you will never mention to dear lord watercress what i have just told you i swear i will never mention it to anybody as long as i live replied lawrence kissing her good-night mother i hope you will be very happy 
when lady alicia had left the room he sank into a chair and buried his face in his hands so nancy is the culprit after all he groaned and i love her as i love my own soul End of chapter twenty one